here to testify against Bill 1589. Imagine that you're confronted by a robber. He's a polite robber, nicely dressed, well-mannered. And so you take the opportunity to point out that what he's doing is against the law. You always carry a copy of the New Hampshire Revised Statutes annotated in your briefcase, so you're able to look it up and tell him that specifically RSA 631, 636.1 says, a person commits the offense of robbery if, in the course of, but he stops you right there. And he says, well, you know, legally I'm not a person. I know I can't be a person because some of those bills you guys have passed and some of the rulings that your judges have handed down have redefined person so that, as a convicted felon, it doesn't include me. And you say, well, what do you say? That he doesn't get to change what common words mean in order to suit his own purposes? You wouldn't really be in a position to do that, would you? Let's imagine another scenario. Your daughter goes off to college. One night, she finds herself in a room with a group of frat boys who begin removing her clothing. She tells them to stop, but they keep going. First her pants, then her shirt, then her bra. And when she's down to her panties, she shouts, I said no, and no means no. There's a quiet pause. Until one of the frat boys, who's been, been paying close attention to your legislative sleight of, hand, sleight of word, smiles in a sinister way and calmly replies, that's not what your dad says. And even if you were to walk into that room at that moment, what could you say to contradict him? This is what comes from arguing that simple declarative sentences that spell out absolute prohibitions can't actually mean what they say. Surely shall make no law can't mean no law. Surely shall not be infringed can't mean not at all. Surely all persons can't mean all persons. Surely the people who wrote those had exceptions in mind that they just neglected to mention. The problem with that line of argument is that we have solid evidence that the people who wrote these documents knew the difference between absolute and qualified prohibitions. Because we find both kinds together in the same documents, often just a sentence or two away from each other. Consider, for example, these prohibitions. No law shall not be infringed in all criminal prosecutions all persons. Now contrast those with, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law, but upon probable cause, nor cruel and unusual punishment, peaceably to assemble. Clearly these were written by people who understood the difference between not and not unless, between all and all except, and so on, which raises an interesting question. Do you justify your actions by telling yourself that they didn't really know what they meant to say? Or that they knew what they meant to say, but were too inarticulate to express it properly? Or the times have changed, so constitutions need to change too. In the first two cases, you're asking us to believe that you're more capable writers and thinkers than Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, George Mason, and so on. To which I suppose the only appropriate response is, well, you know, laughter. So let's give you the benefit of the doubt and stipulate that you don't believe either of those. That leaves the third case. And in the third case, there's a procedure for dealing with changing times and conditions by changing the words of a constitution instead of, like our friend the robber, changing the meanings of common words in order to suit your own purposes. It's called amending the constitution. And while it's generally a lot more trouble than just pushing a bill through a legislature with a bare majority vote, it's meant to be more trouble, so that short-sighted, momentary passion can be restrained by measured, thoughtful, forward-looking consideration. And so that we will, when feelings are in danger of overwhelming reason, be firmly reminded that governments are formed in order to protect rights, and that constitutions are written precisely to place out of the reach of government those solutions that would undermine that purpose. So by ignoring that, you violate not just two particular constitutions, but the very idea of a constitution, and constitutional limits, and government by consent of the people, and ultimately, the rule of law. To which I suppose the only appropriate response is, shame on you. Thank you.